Hey, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today for our first CQF Institute talk of 2022. My name is Christian Figueredo from the CQF team. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, in a few moments, it'll be my pleasure to introduce, introduce our speaker, Ellie Ayash, who's joining us from Paris to take us to today's talk, Neither God Nor Machine, Man's Model. Exciting talk. I know you're all looking forward to it. So on to the business at hand. Today's talk will take about an hour and 15 minutes, might go a few minutes over. We'll see a pretty big topic. Uh, there's uh, lots to cover, of course, but maybe an hour and 15, hour and 20, maybe. We're going to reserve 20 minutes for Q&A as usual. If you have questions for today's speaker, please enter them as you're going as we're going along as they come up in the Q&A panel of the platform. And those are the ground rules. So again, now to the important business at hand, uh, if you introduce Ellie Ayash, who has a background in option market making and went to co-found and is currently the CEO of ITO33, which is a software company specializing in options pricing and derivatives, derivatives pricing. Ellie is also the author of The Blank Swan, The End of Probability and the Medium of Contingency and Inverse View of the Market. It's my honor to hand you over uh, right now to uh, Ellie Ayash. Ellie, thank you so much for joining us. Okay. Thank you very much, Christian. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so I will start sharing my screen uh, now. Can you all see it and hear me clearly? Uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, the two books that Christian has mentioned were philosophy books uh, about finance. Uh, so today, my talk uh, will uh, probably strike you as a bit unusual uh, because I, I won't be uh, showing you any uh, mathematical equations uh, or any mathematical proofs. Rather, I will be only uh, producing philosophical argument in order to compare uh, derivative pricing models from a philosophical point of view. Uh, and today I'm going to compare actually uh, two models. Uh, one is called God's model and the other one is the market model or the machines model. And my hope today is to show you that I, neither one is the good choice and what we want is a man's model. So of course it's uh, all philosophical because here you see a man who is a finite being uh, being caught between uh, two entities with infinite computing power, uh, God on the one hand, who knows the value of everything and the worth of everything. And on the other hand, the machine uh, and the machine is what uh, Marxian critics uh, refer to as the financial market. Uh, so we have um, uh, God's model and the market mo market's model, which I'm going to uh, to uh, to contrast. And um, the title of the talk, uh, "Man's Model," actually refers to part three uh, of a three-part article that I, I have published in the Wilmot Magazine uh, right now. Uh, so uh, part three is the one that was published in January uh, and everything that I will uh, discuss in, the, in this talk, uh, comparing God's model and the market model is actually uh, contained in the, in the three articles. The first one was in September, then November, and the last one, man's model, is January. And uh, so here I'm showing you the, um, uh, the, the title of, of the article, which inspires the, the title of, of the talk. And here I show you the stand first of this article, uh, which uh, explains a little bit clearer what I'm up to today, is that we will recognize in Black Scholes Merton the model of a carpenter, and we will seek ways how truthfully to generalize it. So man's model will be, in my sense, this generalization of Black and Scholes Merton, which I understand as the model of a carpenter. And the expression mo model of a carpenter, I have uh, taken the inspiration for uh, from the cup of a carpenter. Uh, and this image, I'm not sure that, uh, I'm sure that we're all familiar with it. This was taken from uh, Indiana Jones, um, the, the last uh, crusade, uh, which was of course uh, seeking um, uh, the Holy Grail. And here you see uh, in the final uh, scene of the movie, uh, Indiana Jones' hand reaching uh, to the actual uh, Holy Grail. And he said, this must be it because this is the cup of a carpenter as opposed to the other cups uh, that you see, which are more fancy. So my whole point today is that we want something that the man can grab with his hand. And this is the model that I believe will strike the right balance between the two extremes, God's model and the market model or the machine model. And this, by the way, uh, because my article um, was featured in the last issue of Wilmot, it inspired the cover story 
And this is the cover of the Wilmot magazine of this month. And obviously, there's the whole image of food and carpenter uh, on it. So my agenda today is that first I will contrast God's model. Of course, I will explain in a minute what, what is God's model and the market models. And I will explain what the market models is and how uh, they stand opposed to each other. Then I will um, uh, take you into uh, thinking uh, what was really unthought in the market models because market models have been publicized in books. However, I have myself a reading of them which is behind the lines. So I will, I will guide you through that reading. And I will also take the opportunity to think about things that was previously unthought also in Black and Scholes. And these are the things that I want really to, to, to grasp in Black Scholes and generalize uh, in the way that will give me uh, the man's model that I'm after. And man's model will turn out to be, uh, in the end, if hopefully if we have time <laughs> to get there, uh, the regime switching model, which I will um, explain. OK, God's model versus market, market models. Uh, so, uh, as I said, there was three issues of the Wilmot magazine where this um, opposition uh, was explained, uh, part one, part two, and part three, which is uh, the one uh, we are discussing today. Uh, this is the part one, where I first presented God's model and the market's model. So God's model is uh, called this way uh, because it's actually the rough volatility model. And I'm sure that you're aware that this rough volatility model has been quite fashionable um, uh, nowadays. And here, the reason why it's called God's model, I'm quoting from Jim Gatherer, who is one of the proponents of this uh, rough volatility model. He said, I'm quoting him from Risk Magazine, I knew that model had to be correct. I started to call fractional Brownian motion God's model. And fractional Brownian motion is what actually underlies the uh, rough volatility model because it is the process that the volatility uh, process uh, follows. And in another instance, he says, I believe that rough volatility is the true model. And here as a philosopher, I'm a little bit amazed because it's very ambitious uh, to call a model that you're supposed to use in the market uh, true uh, because this belief in fundamental truth and value, uh, I mean, can, can be very surprising because here we are talking about finance as Nassim Taleb would say, it's, it's, it's not physics, because it's in physics that you seek the laws of nature and seek something which is truth. I'm, I'm not sure that in finance and in markets there's something like uh, ultimate truth to be, to be sold. Also, if, this really, if the, really this is God's model, i.e. this is the final truth, the last crusade, the last word, the last arbitrage free for formula, which will give us all the values of everything in the market, this will actually end up contradicting the market because it will be the end of the market if the magic formula was found and we are looking at the market from God's point of view. Fundamental value contradicts uh, price. And this fundamental approach, uh, by the way, where we believe that there are things like uh, uh, underlying truths, uh, is criticized by uh, Ricardo Rebonato, which I quote here in his book. And he says, the fundamental approach is underpinned by one very strong assumption, which is that any trader who chooses and calibrates derivative pricing models is subscribing to the view that the market created option prices must be fully consistent with the true, but a priori unknown process for the underlying. So here, somebody who believes there is truth is thinking that the market who is, creates the, the prices of options is the market following uh, the process of the underlying. The market, in other words, and I'm uh, quoting uh, Rebanato, uh, must be a perfect information processing machine which absorbs all the relevant information about the unknown process followed by the stock and produces prices consistent with each other and with this information set. So this is a very strong assumption here uh, to, to, uh, to, to assume that the market is just some, some machine, information processing machine, and he, the market is coming out with the right prices of uh, options and derivatives based on the knowledge by this machine of what the rule of the true uh, underlying process is for the underlying. As I said, truth is a very ambitious notion in finance. The only other place where I've seen truth mentioned in finance was actually in the field known in the sociology of finance. And here, it's rather the case uh, that the truth is mentioned in the context of, of performativity. So if you read authors in the sociology of finance, they don't say that Black and Scholes, for instance, was the true model at some stage. They say that Black and Scholes, because it was used by a society of traders uh, and human beings, made its own truth uh, performatively. 
And for instance, here I'm quoting from Donald McKenzie who in his book, An Engine, Not a Camera. He, he does say the truth, and he was talking of the truth uh, of the Black Scholes model. Truth did emerge uh, in the 1973 when Black Scholes started being used, but truth inhered in the process as a whole. It was not simply a case of correspondence between the model and an unaltered external reality. So it's not the case, according to sociology of finance, that Black Scholes guessed the truth of the underlying price and therefore of the, of the derivatives market. It's because it was used by trader that it made it, it, its, own, its own truth. So in any case, what I'm saying is that you should be very uh, wary of, uh, of uh, the, the fact that the underlying process is the thing whose truth we are going to guess or to some external reality to which we want to, to confirm. And the reason why um, uh, God's model um, uh, was so tempting, it was, first of all, there was an argument from market microstructure and the time series of real instantaneous volatility, which supported a rough volatility model for the underlying log price. Second, um, the, the research by Gatherer and, and other people demonstrated that after reasoning on the uh, microstructure of the market and reasoning on the empirical time series of volatility and finding that it's a rough volatility model, to crown it all, option prices seem to confirm uh, that the model is the rough volatility. So they say both the instantaneous assets volatility in, in, the, in the sense of the time series of the, uh, of the uh, instantaneous volatility and the option implied volatilities seem to agree with the assumption of the rough volatility model. And this is why they end up at, ended up to co calling it the true model, because it's the right model according to them, both in the real measure and in the risk potential measure. So what you have to keep in mind is that this approach, the fundamental approach that De Bonato has criticized, is criticizing the fact that why should an option market correspond to the underlying uh, process and how is it possible? How do, can we imagine that the market is pricing the derivatives uh, in accordance with the assumption of the underlying process, which in Black Scholes, for instance, is a Brownian motion with, with constant volatility, and which in the rough volatility model will be a stochastic volatility model where volatility follows a fractional Brownian process? So, where does this whole idea come from uh, that option prices should be priced off? the um, underlying, um, uh, underlying um, uh, asset process. This is in contrast to what uh, Bergomi, uh, Lorenzo Bergomi calls grown up finance because totally contrary to this view, he argues the following. He says the mistake done in master's degrees in quant finance is to start from the assumption of a stochastic process for the underlying, a thing we're not even sure exists. We're not even sure exists. So contrary to the whole fundamental view, he says we're not even sure that there is such a thing as an underlying stochastic process uh, to base the option pricing on it. And this is why, because of this mistake, according to Bergomi, uh, the natural question students have is, but what if my underlier is no longer uh, log normal? What if it's not a diffusive process with content parameters? Do I throw Black and Scholes away? And the answer, according to the view that is the grown-up finance is that no, God doesn't exist. The underlying process doesn't exist. Therefore, you must keep the BSM pricing function as a function, as a pricing rule, if you will, but not the BSM model of the underlying price because it's not, it doesn't exist. And later I will show you how in the approach, which is opposite to God's model, which is the market models, how we talk about pricing functions and pricing rules as opposed to uh, correspondence with the truth of the underlying process that nobody can observe and we're not even sure exists. And this is why Bergomi at the opening of his book, um, this book here, I'll show you in a minute, he says it may come as a surprise to many that despite the widely publicized inconsistency between the actual dynamics of financial securities and the idealized log normal dynamics of the BSM model, the BSM model is still used daily in banks to risk manage derivative books. So even though everybody knows that the underlying process is nowhere, nowhere near being log normal, everybody's still using in the banks. So therefore, it's not the underlying process that is the issue here. And this is a quote that I'm uh, extracting from his book, this book here. It's uh, quite in the opening pages of, of the book, Stochastic Volatility Modeling. And so Bergomi will be the major proponent in my, uh, in my talk of the market models, which are here to be opposed to a God's model or to the belief in fundamental value. 
So what is really the premise in the approach of market model and in the, in the premise and the whole of Bergomi's book? The premise is that we believe in the price surface of derivatives, not in any theoretical depth and stochastic structure lying underneath. And to Bergomi, a pricing equation, as opposed to a pricing model, is essentially an analytical accounting device in which the prices of the underlier and of the derivative are equal entries. And I do uh, say it, these are prices because both the price of the underlying and the price of the derivative, derivative are supposed to be given by the market, already given in the market. So no one is producing them out of theory. They're already given in the market. And all we can write quantitatively is a PNL of the hedged position of the derivative with the underlying and start to control the PNL. So a pricing equation, the one that we will derive, for instance, in this instance, Bergomi will derive the Black and Scholes equation, starts by, first of all, uh, writing a PNL um, expression in an, uh, just an accounting. So you write the, the, the PNL and uh, as you, you, the delta is made equal to the partial derivative of P, the pricing function with respect to stock, uh, uh, terms cancel out, as you know, and you end up uh, with only second term order um, in the equation. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with that. And in order to then derive the, the Black-Scholes pricing equations, all you need to observe is that it's enough that should, should exist a break-even level of volatility uh, for the e equation of Black-Scholes to be derived without any assumption about the underlying process or about um, uh, pricing in this sense. And uh, Bergomi says derivative practitioners, as opposed to derivative, uh, you know, theoreticians, are content with barely floating safely and making as few assumptions as possible about future market conditions. So no assumptions about, you know, the underlying uh, process or whatnot. The only thing that counts is controlling the PNL of the hedged position, regardless of what goes underneath or of what's truly underlying from God's point of view. And this philosophically is completely a program programmatic, pragmatical um, attitude uh, as opposed to a metaphysical attitude where we are looking for ultimate truths. You're just pragmatical because you are controlling the PNL. And this, what's very important is that the whole attitude is exposed as opposed to ex ante because it's exposed that you compute the PNL, exposed yet that you try to control it, and you hope that there will be exposed a certain break-even level of volatility. This is completely different from standing here or standing from God's point of view and looking at the world ex ante and trying to figure a theory and guess what the truth is and price everything out of the truth. And by the way, if we speak of market models, isn't that an oxymoron? Because this is a market, so how can we model the market? And actually, so this is the definition of the market models. If you want to understand why there might be a paradox in the, in the word market model, market models, to, to, to summarize, do not rely on an underlying stochastic structure, but only on the existing options market. So it's a bit strange because we, ha we, are, we are devising a model to price options, yet the assumption is that options exist already in the market and are already priced by the market. And therefore the question is to, to price derivatives, shall we rely on a market model where only options market exist and there exists no underlying stochastic process or on an expect expectation calculation as per you know rough volatility or whatnot, where we might happen to know what probability volatility and even rough volatility mean, but we don't know what a volatility market means. So this is why my whole attitude here today is philosophical because what I want is actually through a thorough reading of Bergomi and the criticism of, of, um, of uh, rough volatility through reading Bergomi, this reading sheds, according to me, new perspectives on rough volatility in relation to the meaning of the option market. So my, my whole attitude here today is to really, first of all, be clear on what market are we talking about? What is the meaning of the market? What's the point of view that we have to, to the market? Because we're not sure uh, is the market it is embodied statistical crowd and we think that there is no one in particular doing anything and just the crowd statistically is adjusting itself and statistically it's guessing you know the fair value of things or is it a machine the market or is it the market that we are looking at from the point of view of, of a market maker or is the market a field of sociological studies or is the market for an investor 
So the whole point is, first of all, to see what point of view we want to adopt of the, on the market in order to be able to compare these different models. This is just uh, to note the second part of uh, my, my three-part article. Uh, and the, um, the subtitle is, uh, is where I illuminate two concepts that I have detected in Liber Gomez books, which are very important. And I will um, speak of, the, of them later. The, the first one is the trading decision. And the second one is the pricing function, which is like the, the major concept that we have here, the pricing function of the market as opposed to uh, a, a, an expectation calculation of or computing value as seen from, uh, from the point of view of truth. And um, um, uh, these two uh, major concepts of Bergomi are the ones that they will destroy probability, uh, more or less, as I will show you. And it turns out that probability and the whole of theory of stochastic processes and the like, and even the whole of the paradox of the orthodox theory of finance that follows uh, stochastic processes and uh, follows expectation, they only become interpretations and not reality. This is what I'll try to show you when I discuss more the market models. So the peculiar position of the market models is that they, they don't believe there is any ultimate truth. There is only ongoing practice, only trading on, in the market, only floating on the surface. The market has no beginning and no end. So it's not that somebody uh, has produced the market out of a formula. Options, and this is very important, options have always been hedged with options. So, so it's, uh, imagine that we enter the market already as an option trader, and already this option trader is not going to compute options and hedge them only with the underlying, but already with already existing options and already uh, options that are already priced, which actually uh, poses a difficulty because uh, we are supposed in the end to deliver mathematical models, yet they are always ruled by the market, even overruled by the market. Why? Because the options that you are going to use uh, 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 as the true drivers of the model are already given by the market, yet we want models that price those options. And uh, we have to think of them as not models of the market again, because we cannot model the market, but models that we use in the market. And because of the fact that we are looking to price options, yet we are relying on options to feed into our model to price the options, it seems that there is no ground and no foundation and no theory as in you know, theoretical finance. Still, we need to say uh, something if there is no theory, at least to explain uh, why uh, the technology uh, of the pricing models exist. And this, I believe, why Bergomi wrote his book, uh, because it's not a, a book of theory, it's a book of technology. So again, the important thing to keep in mind about, um, about market models is that uh, because whatever you do uh, the options that you are going to price, that the, the exotic options are going to be hedged by other options, typically the vanilla, it means that you will always be hedging out of the model, uh, outside the model, because the model itself will give you, among other things, the prices of the vanillas, yet in the next minute, you are going to read the prices of the vanillas from the market, and they will be different from the prediction of the model, yet you are going to hedge with this new inflow information uh, coming from the Madilla, which contradicts uh, the model. This is called out of model hedging. And it means also that you will be always recalibrating the model to the new update of vanilla prices. And here I quote Rebonato again, which really uh, in this quotation, he shows you the real difficulty in this. He says in his book, possibly no aspect of derivatives trading. And again, I emphasize trading because we are talking about practice here has a deeper reaching impact on pricing than the joint practices of out of model hedging and model recalibration. And he continues by saying, similarly important, universal and difficult to justify theoretically is the practice of recalibrating a model to the current market plane vanilla prices throughout the life of the complex trade. So here he is telling us that this practice on which the market models again are going to be completely based, which is always out of model hedging and recalibration is very difficult to justify theoretically. That's why I'm saying there is no theory of the market models, but only, only practice. So the, the point that I note here is that what used to be in the, in the, in the times of Rebonato, his book dates back to 2004. Now with Vergomi, we are in 2015. So what used to be, uh, what used to be, what used to have a devastating impact on the pricing model according to Rebonato, has now become with Bergomi the premise of the market model. 
And this is uh, exactly grown up finance because we no longer believe in the old principles of the underlying uh, truth. And here, uh, um, uh, just I comment by saying there is two answers to, 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 to this approach of the market model, Biagini and Kant in the paper of, uh, from 2006, where in the paper they say our goal in the present work is to present a formulation of the mountain Gale approach to derivative pricing, which is consistent with the way arbitrage constraints are formulated by market participants, namely in terms of market prices, and consistent with the way derivative pricing models are specified and calibrated in practice and not in theory, that is without referring to any objective probability measure. So in that paper, they try to work out ways that we can price derivatives and they call it uh, a pricing rule, not a pricing model, without necessarily believing that there is a, a, an underlying process um, that the underlying is following and that the uh, values of derivatives are computed as expectation form. So to, to me, this is like a, a precursor of this whole approach. And this is why they call it, the, the title of the paper is model free representation of pricing rules as conditional expectations. So there's a whole uh, trend of thinking here, which is to say, it's no longer the underlying process that is going to rule or dictate on us the values of derivative, but it's something else. What is the something else? The market of options in itself. So that's the, that's the difficulty. And this whole criticism of the underlying process is something that has occupied me in the last book that I have published, uh, the, the Medium of Contingency, which um, uh, strangely enough was out in 2015, exactly the same date that Bergomi's book was out. So I quote you um, this from my book, where I say, why should the derivative be a constituent part of the market? Why should the definition of the market even reside in the fact that the underlying and the derivative trade alongside each other without any distinction of degree or nature, without the fact that there's underlying and derivative which, whose value we compute uh, as an expectation, because it's too late now and we have a derivatives market. So there is no way around the fact. And I continue by saying, must we understand that to represent the trading of the underlying by a stochastic process, whose consequence is the evaluation by expectation of the derivative written on that underlying is in contradiction with the matter of the market? And the answer is yes. That, that's why I'm also uh, uh, battling against uh, the assumption of, of, of underlying stochastic process. What is it I say in the reality of the market that is in contradiction with the registers of statistics? And my whole book, which uh, also is a, is, a, is a book of criticism of derivative pricing model and therefore a book of philosophy is exactly in the end, like almost the, the other side of Bergomi's book. And there is not one equation if in my book because it's all like philosophy. And I, whereas the Bergomi's book is full of equation, but in a sense, when I read Bergomi's book in 2015, I was struck by the similarity between the two approaches uh, so you, you, you can read my book as actually a, a philosophical criticism and com or commentary of the approach by Bergomi. So again, to go back to philosophy, why there is an emergence of philosophical debate? Because on the one hand, you have Gadderall who says that the rough volatility model is the true model. On the other hand, you have the, uh, Bergomi who says the underlying stochastic process doesn't exist. Truth, existence, these are philosophical notions. And that's why, as I said at the beginning, it's from philosophical thinking and from philosophical argument that I would like in the end to deduce um, uh, the, the true model uh, between codes, which I called man, man's model. I want to entertain philosophical reflection and think things previously unnoticed or even unthought in the market models. And by the way, also in Black Scholes Merton. So now I will discuss market models and tell you um, uh, what everybody knows about them and what I noticed um, uh, that was uh, unnoticed or what I call the unthought in the market models. So first of all, the thing that we know, what is the thought of the market models? Or what's the idea of the market models? Again, this is something which we can call the inversion of causality, meaning black shells merton is an accounting equation and not a theoretical model. So we write the PML uh, ex post, and it's not that we go from the underlying process to compute values. And that's why uh, we speak, and Bergomi in, in his book is very consistent in this notation. We speak of a pricing function with, capi with capital P and not of a valuation function, as you know, in the papers by Black Scholes and the like, where we compute the values of derivative, because here pricing function, it's something that 
we get, are going to get, which is the output of our model, yet the, the assumption, again, it's, it's the market price already, okay? And as I said, it's the whole theory, or not theory, the whole practice is based on an accounting argument and on the fact that there, there might exist, the hope is that there exists a break-even volatility uh, to, get, to get us the equation rather than on, on theory. And there is no assumption of an underlying process. And this I cite here very rapidly, Schaffer and Wolf, who are two authors, which, which I will comment a little bit later, who have written a book uh, called um, um, uh, Probability and Finance, It's Only a Game, the book was out in 2001. It's, it's amazing because the, the, the whole idea there also is no longer to believe in underlying stochastic structure and to only uh, do accounting and only do things ex post uh, in order to derive all the equations. And so when there is multiple hedging instruments, the pricing function is no longer P, T, or, and S, but becomes P of T, S, and Xi, where the Xi are the implied volatilities of you know, the uh, vanilla instruments uh, that we are going to use uh, of other hedging instruments or other underlying instruments. In the case of Bergomi in um, uh, the, the Bergomi model, these are known to be the implied volatilities of forward variance contracts. However, in general, they could be, and Bergomi is very uh, complete in his book. Uh, so the forward variance contracts he has selected because yeah, they are easier to handle uh, analytically, but uh, so size could have been the implied vols of vanillas. And of course, when you have multiple hedging instruments and you write the accounting equations that I showed you earlier with multiple um, arguments, it's no longer a break even uh, volatility number uh, that you hope to get, which will get you your pricing equation, but it becomes a break even covariance mat matrix involving all the underliers, meaning S, the stock, and of course, the size, which are the uh, prices or the, of, the, of the vanilla instruments you are using to hedge. And again, here, the reason uh, why you have vanilla is that the assumption, the major assumptions is that the vanilla options have always traded and you've always been hedging options with options. And this is how we manage uh, with the general uh, the pricing equation with, with multiple argument to, to derive a PDE, which I will show you in a minute. And the fundamental principle to keep in mind, which is going to pose all the conceptual difficulties, is that the vanillas, either the, you know, the vanilla options or the forward variance contracts that uh, actually Bergomi is using, the fundamental principle is that vanillas are on an equal footing with the underlying asset S. Their market prices of the vanillas or the implied volatilities are independent state variables. That, that's the difficulty because we need them to be independent state variables in the formalism of the market models, but yet in the end, they are derivative on the underlying S. So how can they be independent variables? That's the difficulty that I'm going to comment in a minute. So that's the PDE uh, that if this is a, here a page, uh, the page, the famous page in Bergomi's books where he writes the PDE involving uh, not only the, um, uh, the stock S, but all the uh, here, all the um, uh, other hedging instruments. So you see that it's a multiple dimension PDEs and you have as many state variables as you have size and it's a continuum, uh, uh, formally speaking, of such, of such variables. In the case of the vanilla surface, it will be all options of strike K and maturity T. In the case of the forward variance curve, it will be all uh, the four forward variance contracts with, with, with maturity Ts. So you have infinitely many uh, state variables here in this formal um, expression of the PDE, okay? Uh, so this is the pricing PDE. And to get there, this is important uh, in order to introduce Black Shores. In order to get there, how did we get there? Um, uh, there is a passage, first of all, where um, uh, we, uh, Bergomi uses uh, Black and Shoals to actually get us, get the argument going that we should be using other instruments uh, than the underlying stock to hedge the exotic. And, what is the problem with, with, with Black and Scholes? Is Black Scholes is not strictly speaking a market model itself. Why? Because it's a model that um, um, uh, which happened with only the underlying equity S as underlying. There wasn't um, yet an options market before Black Scholes. So Black and Scholes is not a market model, but is typical of market models. That's that's how Bergomi uh, call, call, calls it. 
However, the way he sets the argument going is that he uses, first of all, black shoals to cancel the gamma of the exotic option with the gamma of the vanilla option, one, uh, one vanilla option, using the DSM implied volatility of the latter. And this he calls the trading decision. So to justify, to motivate the argument why you need to have other hedging instruments than the underlying S, of course, the underlying S is not sufficient because, because, because of gamma risk and volatility risk. So first of all, the practice of traders were not only to hedge the exotic option, say, with the underlying, but also to cancel the vega and the gamma of the exotic option with a, another uh, vanilla option. Uh, this is practice, not theory. And this is what Bergomi calls the trading decision. So the trading decision is that the traders decide to use the vanillas as, as active hedges uh, in the um, uh, pricing of the exotic. And this is why, if you follow through the argument, modeling the implied volatilities of the vanillas become, becomes a key uh, thing because now that you are using, in, using them to hedge the exotic options, you have to model to, to the implied volatilities, the dynamics and the implied volatilities of the vanilla. And in the chapter where he derives um, the key PDE that I showed you earlier, he starts the chapter by saying, in this chapter, we model implied volatilities directly. And so stochastic volatility models of the underlying asset, and this is the important uh, argument, are only the theater of motion of implied volatilities of vanilla options. So again, we are not trying to model the volatility of the underlying asset and say that that volatility is stochastic and may become rough volatility later or not, because the underlying process is of no importance and we are not even sure it exists. But formally, we need to have a stochastic volatility model of the underlying asset in order that inside that model, the implied volatilities of the vanilla may become stochastic and may move, okay? And of course, the correlation structure of the vanilla prices uh, cannot be anything whatsoever. It's true that I said that the vanillas are completely independent state variables. Uh, that's what the ideally the market model uh, principle wants is that they are independent uh, hedging um, instruments, therefore, they are independent state variables, but we all know that because they are derivative on the underlying, there cannot be the correlation structure between the vanilla prices or between the implied vols of the forward variance contracts cannot be anything whatsoever because those instruments, even though we want to, to use them as independent, actually are all covertly derivative on the same underlying. So that's why I note here, like um, uh, this um, uh, progression here, so for instance, uh, again, I'm, I'm extracting um, uh, from um, uh, Bergomi's book. So there's a progression from constant break-even volatility to local break-even covariance matrix. Why? Because in the first instance, when he was deriving the Black and Scholes equation and he called it the unhedged case because he wasn't using vanilla options to hedge, we were free to choose the implied volatility uh, uh, sigma had as our best estimate of future implied volatility and kept it constant. So when, when deriving the Black-Scholes equation, the, the, the simplest accounting equation that we have, yes, we hoped that there existed a break-even volatility and we considered it constant. And the same happens if you are using multiple um, uh, hedging instruments, which are not derivatives, which are like, um, if imagine you are, you are pricing with multiple underlyings, in that case, you have a break-even covariance mat matrix, and still the coefficients of that ma matrix can be constant. However, when it becomes a matter of using as, as hedging instruments, instruments that are derivatives, derivative on the same underlying, if you follow through uh, the, the, the notations in, in Bergomi, strictly speaking, he can no longer write a correlation between the stock and the hedging uh, vanillas or correlation between the vanillas as a constant, it's, it's going to become local expressions, of course, because even though he says that they are independent, in the end, we all know that they derive on the same underlying. So their correlation structure has to be constrained in, in, in a way. And here there is in a footnote, um, a, 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 an argument that exactly explains that 
So even though the forward variance curve is supposed to be the set of independent hedging instruments, he says that we must resort, following an analysis by Hans Bühler, we must resort to a Markov representation of the variance curve of the type um, where the variance curve depends is, is a certain functional of um, uh, xt, where xt is a vector diffusive process. And this amounts to enforcing a parametric representation of the variance curve. So it cannot be anything whatsoever. We have to parameterize it because arbitrary variance swap term structures cannot be accommodated. So here is the difficulty. So even though the wish is that the hedging instruments be totally independent, ultimately, if you want to get the actual numerical solution, you have to have an assumption of some kind, uh, uh, to have an assumption and to, to, to resort to theory. So that's why I say, let's pause for a minute. There was no underlying theory when we derived the BSM equation from a purely accounting argument where the two things that we were monitoring was, you know, the, the change of price of the derivative and the, cha the change of price of the underlying asset. Now, suddenly, when we move to a situation where we, we have multiple hedging uh, vanillas, there's a lot of theory and we have to have uh, an underlying stochastic process or a Markov representation or diffusive uh, vector. But if you really look uh, at what is what I'm really saying here, we shouldn't believe uh, that the stochastic process that we are ultimately selecting in order to get the numerical pricing going, you shouldn't believe that it's reality. It's only an interpretation. So, because if, again, let's think, think for a moment, if, if you make the exotic a function of the vanillas, ultimately the, the exotic um, uh, uh, option is ultimately only a, a, a derivative on the on the on the underlying equity, uh, so it cannot be. Uh, if you if you go to, to to write the PDE, if you go to write the PDE, um, uh, you you cannot uh, just um, uh, write a PDE here and have the uh, state variables which are the implied vols of the of the of the vanillas. This is the formal PDE that, uh, that uh, Bergomi has shown you. But when it comes a matter of actually writing the mechanics of the, of the, of the computation, you have to find a process which with only the underlying uh, equity as sole factor in order to be able to, to do the combination backward. Why? Because the, the exotic is only a function of the underlying, not of the vanillas, actually. Uh, but, the, but again, this um, underlying uh, process of the underlying asset that, that Bergomi or anyone using the market model will need in order to get the computation going uh, is only an interpretation. And even though this underlying stochastic process in the, in, um, it, it imposes constraints on the, on the variance curve, Bergomi is very clear, clear in saying that the formation modes of the variance curve generated by the processes have no special significance. Model factors simply set the structure and rank of the break-even covariance matrix of the gamma theta PNL of a hedge position. And it's important to stress that ultimately the calculation of deltas uh, of the exotic is not connected in any way to the covariance structure of the hedging instruments in the model at hand. So formally speaking, we have a formula, a very general PDE that we have written with an infinity of, of vanillas or an infinity of forward variance contracts. We write, we write that uh, PDE that I showed you earlier. However, when it comes to actually doing the actual computation, we have to make assumptions and we have to constrain the uh, vanillas one way or, or the other, if only because covertly speaking, they are underlain by, uh, by, uh, by an underlying, which is the equity S. So if, if you do that, you are, you, you can tell Bergomi, so what is it in the end? Is there an underlying process or not ultimately? Because we are using it to do the computation. So the answer is no, it's only a way to do the computation. And when it comes back to practice again, meaning computing the delta of the exotic, you shouldn't believe what you are doing. You shouldn't believe that you are using this model really uh, and compute the deltas because the deltas are the things that matter and will help you uh, control the PNL. You should completely do out of model hedging, as I said earlier, and not believe uh, the particular uh, structure that is constraining your model. Okay. 
So this is what's taking me to what I think is the unthought uh, in, in this whole problem, which I call the real nature of the pricing function, because we are, we are all we are wondering, so what is this pricing function who in all practical instances, I'm going to write as a specific stochastic volatility model with factors. Uh, so typically Bergomi will have a two factor uh, stochastic model. Yet I'm, say I'm saying that really it is not um, constrained by such a process. So only in the computation, in the practical computation, do we go backward uh, following the stochastic process. I mean, going backward from the maturity of the exotic trade or maturity of the option, going backward in a tree where the underlying stochastic process seems to be the, the, the stochastic process of the underlying. So only in the computation do we go backward, but the pricing function itself is something else, something more than this. The probabilistic interpretation which is only here to help us achieve the computation or moving backward from the final payoff of the exotic uh, option uh, seems to imply that the state variables uh, size in reality stand for hidden volatility states. Because if you have a multidimensional tree and I'm pricing my exotic going backward from, you know, from the knockout barrier or from the uh, maturity of the exotic, and as I go back in my tree, what state variable do I have? I have the underlying equity S and the formalism of the market models tells me as other state variables, I have the prices of the other vanillas. But in actual fact, in the tree, the only thing that will make a difference is that if under the prices of the, uh, of the vanillas, I have something like stochastic volatility of the underlying equity because in the tree going backwards in the expectation cal calculation, the only thing that will make a difference and the other dimension for the computation of the expectation, if whether volatility uh, is higher, the volatility of the asset, I mean, is higher or not, it won't make a difference whether the price of the vanilla is higher or not. Okay, so it's but it's only the probabilistic interpretation that seems to imply that the state variables uh, size, which are market prices, in reality stand for hidden volatility states. We must resist the thought uh, that under the state variables, which are market prices, there is a background metaphysical parameters such as volatility, because the market is such, the market, because this is a market model is such, that those background metaphysical parameters, such as volatility or volatility or volatility, have really been replaced by tradables, have really been replaced by the prices of the vanilla. So that's the effort in the thinking that we must, we must uh, achieve in order to understand really the philosophy of market models. Even though in computing, and we will be computing under a process of the underlying equity. And even though from that point of view, it seems there is no difference from, from, from between what the market model is doing and what a uh, stochastic volatility model such as Heston or, or raw volatility is doing. In the philosophy, I should resist that thought and really believe that there is no, no such a thing as an underlying process and there is no such a thing as volatility and volatility or volatility, which is, if you will, are engraved in the walls of space and I'm doing my backward computation with that. No, there's only prices of other derivatives such as vanillas and the forward, uh, uh, forward variance contracts. So the belief here should be that given the market, because our whole assumption is the market exists, given the market forces, given the market price surface of the vanillas and of the forward uh, variance contracts, simply automatically, we should believe that simply automatically, this is the exotic option price output by the pricing function. So the whole philosophy of the thing is really to forget about the underlying stochastic process, even though in the um, uh, numerical um, uh, uh, procedure, I, I might need it. And really, is even to forget that there is something as the maturity of the exotic trade. Simply now, automatically, the pricing function um, gives me the exotic price given the given market um, condition. So only a model can be written. The pricing function, which is the superior uh, philosophical concept here, cannot be written because it's real. So you, you might want to think of the pricing function as not a model, but as, as some machine, which is the market, remember, a machine learning that ha has learned a lot of models. Not any one of them is the model, but of course has learned it from the future, not from the past of the data. So it seems that we are in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in a new logic where 
if you believe what I'm saying, meaning I shouldn't really um, uh, read the underlying stochastic process as anything but a interpretation. So it means that the exotic option that I'm pricing is no longer derivative on the underliers, either the Vega hedging instruments or the underlying asset. So we are no longer in the logic of a derivative written over an underlying, a derivative such as I can price it by expectation. The underliers, by the way, are no longer necessarily themselves derivative on their underlying asset. Because even though um, the, the pricing function of the exotic, we are saying that the other hedging instruments that are here to hedge me against volatility and whatnot, even though I'm saying they must be derivative on the underlying asset, but if you look through the actual formalism, there is nothing that compels that they should be derivative on the underlying asset itself. It might be very well that I'm pricing an exotic on the SNP, and the hedging instruments for some reason, because the market wants it this way, the other hedging instruments are not even uh, derivative on the underlying, uh, on the same underlying asset. Uh, they just, those, underli those underliers just underlie the pricing function because the belief is that the market will have solved all the problems and dissolved all the dogma, even the dogma of the payoff constraint, because ultimately maybe, maybe even the um, uh, even if I approach the the, the 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 maturity of the exotic option, and I really there, I want to believe that only the underlying will be determining the value of the exotic. Maybe things will happen. Maybe maybe I don't know. I mean, the market will break, and something else uh, will be underlying it. And by the way, if you um, uh, follow through the uh, argumentation in Bergomi, remember that in what I have called the proto reasoning, he first of all, wanted to price an exotic option. And he did use, he did use a vanilla option to cancel the gamma and the, and the vega of that exotic option with the vanilla option. And so if he does so, obviously the vanilla option that will become another hedging instrument will have to be written on the same underlying in the reasoning, because how could you cancel the gamma if they are not written on the same underlying? So this Bergomi makes clear in what I have called the proto reasoning. This he made, I remember to convince us that we should resort to other hedging instruments than the underlying asset. But then when you turn the page and you start talking about market models, there's nothing that indicates that the infinity of, 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 of other state variables uh, are derivative on the same underlying because that just, that just underlie the pricing function, that's it. So the, um, uh, but of course we all know that they should be derivative on the, um, on the underlying, otherwise they won't work, but this is not in the formalism. So the reality of the pricing function, what it is really, or how it is superior to the probabilistic interpretation or diagram, because again, it has always to rely on a probabilistic diagram if only to get the computation going. So the reality of the pricing function or how it is superior to the probabilistic, superior to the probabilistic interpretation or diagram resides in the calibration, because you ask, if we are saying that in all cases, I'm going to use a, 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 a classical stochastic process in order to conduct my backward procedure and price my exotic. So what, what I mean, what, what is it that then that the pricing function has on top of that? I say that it, the fact that I'm saying it's only underlain by prices of vanillas, even though in practice, in, in the computation, I will go to the underlying, the only advantage of saying that it is underlain by prices of vanillas is to allow for the pricing function to one way or the one day without any warning, the whole stochastic structure changes. So maybe one day Bergome is going to be computing the exotics with a two factor uh, uh, stochastic model. And then the second day it's going to be four factor. And he will say, no, it's not a break of my logic because the pricing function from the start, I told you that the underlying stochastic process that I'm using to compute it is only interp an interpretation. It's not the reality. The pricing function is above that. It is. It can be recalibrated and it's inscribed in its essence that there should be recalibration. So recalibration, ultimately, if I read uh, through this whole thing, that I, I said was unthought about the market models. My conclusion is that recalibration or the fact that I can allow the stochastic process that I have used just for computation, that I, I can allow it suddenly to change to something else. This is what I call recalibration. This is actually the essence of, of the superiority of the pricing function and of the superiority of the, of the market models. Remember that I said that what Ribonato said 
was the major challenge has become now the premise and even the essence. And in this way, the logic becomes forward and in, is no longer backward because the backwardation, the logic of going backward is something that we inherit from probability. It's only when I do probability computation in the tree that I, I, I start with the uh, maturity of the option and go back with volatility states. But now that I'm saying that this is only in, an interpretation, this is only doing for numerical um, um, uh, the procedure, but actually what the philosophically speaking, the pricing function is, is that, is that this whole diagram of probability can change all of a sudden, the logic becomes forward looking, not backward looking. And this is what it should be because pricing, the pricing function or people trading in the market should follow the time in the right direction, not in the, in the backward direction. It's always, it's always amazed a lot of people that everything we do in finance is going backward. So here with the logic of the pricing function is how I believe, philosophically speaking, you uh, recover the forward logic, which is the logic of, of history because, um, and every day you are going to recalibrate anyway. The, the reality is they're going to recalibrate your model and the logic in reality is always forward. And he, all I'm saying here is that the pricing function was the insistence that the probability is only an interpretation and not reality. The pricing function, if I really um, uh, wonder what is it really, it becomes a, a forward going, a forward looking concept uh, in, in my eyes. And therefore, the market, the market now, the, this gives us like a, a right point of view on the market. So, fr from the point of view of the market, probability is an interpretation, it's not reality. It's not even reality as seen by the market model. That's the, the, that's the thing. So, it's not the market model. The reality of the market model is not probability. And, th and therefore the market is no longer a probability calculator. So that's important. The market is superior to that. The market computing the value of the prices of derivatives is not a matter of computing expectations uh, by, by using a probability um, computation. The market is superior to probability. Why? Because of recalibration, it overrides the whole structure of states of the world and the whole stochastic structure that we all have in mind when, when we do probability. And by the way, when we apply arbitrage principle also, the arbitrage principle and the orthodox theory of finance is based on the structure of states of the world. It's based on probability. And here I'm saying that the market is superior to arbitrage. That's what I'm saying, actually. I'm saying, yes, the, the market, uh, the market which the market models are modeling, is superior even to the arbitrage non-arbitrage principle. And the market integrates non-probabilistic effects. It has to because uh, it's not probability that there's in the market. It's something larger than probability. And this is where we go back to Schaeffer and Wolfk because if you read in their book, where they, as I said, they propose a framework which is to my eyes very similar to the framework, to the philosophical framework in which I'm reading the market models, they say literally, our framework differs most strikingly from the measure theoretical framework or from the probabilistic framework in its ability to model open processes, processes that are open to influences that we cannot model even probabilistically. So that to me is the, is the key of why the pricing function of Bergomi or of the market model is superior to probability because I have to understand in it that it, it integrates effects that we cannot even model probabilistically. Uh, so even though you are always tempted, you know, to recover uh, those effects by some kind of probability by saying, well, if volatility is changing uh, randomly, then I will model a process for probability. And if you do that and you write a second process probability, you fall again in the trap of the backward uh, procedure because all you have done is write another stochastic process. So the whole idea is not to write a stochastic process. This is what I'm looking for. This is the good thing in the market models. And this is why in the model that I will be looking uh, for later, as I will show you in the last 20 minutes, uh, it's going to be a compromise uh, between, because I think that the market, mod market models go maybe a little bit uh, too far in the direction of no longer believing that there is structure at all, because we will see that we want structure in a way. I'll show you how. Anyway, the important thing to notice, and this is also something that it's not really, hasn't really been noticed in, in Bergomi because he's very uh, uh, brief when he says so. He is always looking for a volatility market. So for instance, in page number five of the book, when he was deriving the Black and Scholes equation, at some point he, say, he says, he, lit, he writes literally this, he says, in the absence of a volatility market for the underlying S, sigma, 
uh, or the, the, the constant volatility that you will be using in the Black Scholes formula should be chosen as our best estimate of future realized volatility. So, okay, so you, you feel that this is the same as Black Scholes. So, sigma is the estimate of future realized volatility. However, what, what attracts my attention is that even though in the process of deriving the Black and Scholes equation, he starts by saying, in the absence of a volatility market, so what's the point of deriving the Black Scholes equation if you are, you are assuming that there is already a volatility market? And because there isn't one, because he's, he's, he's deriving Black Scholes ex nihilo, he, he, he does this assumption. But the reason I'm saying this is that it's always a demand that there should exist a volatility market in order to replace all assumptions uh, that we make about uh, parameters such as volatility. And for instance, later, much later in the book, around page 200, when he considers the forward variance contracts, he repeats exactly the same uh, observation. He says, if there existed a market of options written on the uh, forward variance contracts with maturity ranging from the instant of now to their maturity, the volatility risk of the forward variance contract of maturity capital T could be hedged away and the volatility of uh, that forward balance contract would be derived from market implied volatilities. So even when he says that we have moved to a stage where the hedging instruments that we have is the multiplicity of the forward balance contracts. And so therefore those instruments have become the new underliers and you wonder how is he going to model their volatilities in order to write his equation. He insists in saying I don't want to model volatility. Ideally, I'm looking for the volatility market of those volatility instruments. But because there doesn't exist one yet, I have to make an assumption. So he says, in general, we will have no choice but to carry a position on the realized volatility of the forward volume curve. And thus, we will need to make assumptions that will depend on. So the assumption that he will make is exactly the Bergomi model of n factors or two factors. But the important thing to have in mind is that even though he proposes his model, in his mind, it never really was uh, settled that this was the final model because he's always looking for a model where instead of making the assumption of the two factors of volatility of the N factor, he would get those from a market of instruments written on the volatility instruments. So say of options written on VIX or of options written on the forward variance um, um, curve. And it's only because at that stage there doesn't exist such a thing that he settles for an assumption and he proposes his model. So the reason I'm finishing this presentation of the market model with that is that it, there is always a, a lack here. So can we improve on that lack and find a model where there is no uh, limit, where I can always include the next volatility market? And the reason why Bergomi uh, can, um, uh, if you will, um, uh, afford to stop at that level is that the, the models that he proposed were used by Societe Generale as a market maker of exotic options. So the, the vanilla options were all that they needed from the market as a given, but the price of the exotic option, they were posting themselves as being a market maker. And that's, that's why the procedure stopped there. It's not the case that the exotic options are going to be integrated in the market and later become themselves the uh, inputs of a superior model, because uh, the, in a way, Sogjan is was the ultimate market maker. But if you want to continue the spirit of the market models, you should, in theory, be looking for a model that always adapts to the next volatility market and is open to adding in the mix uh, as underliers not only the vanilla options or the or, 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 or the VIX futures, but also options on the VIX, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So to the contrary, I want to be open to the volatility market at every at any level, and this will be the guiding principle to possibly find the um, um, uh, the model I'm looking at. Okay, so very quickly now, in order to 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 get there, uh, I want to get it. I mean, my hope is to get it from something that was unthought in Black Scholes uh, uh, itself, and Black Scholes in a way is at the same time, the simplest and the hardest to understand because the laws, uh, because Black Scholes is the big bang. It's the first model. It's the model that generated the options market uh, in a sense. And uh, we can say that the laws of physics of the current and generic universe was where option exists because we are already immersed in option market do not apply to, to Black and Scholes because it was before uh, the birth of the option market. 
And but back shoals is, is, is difficult to understand, even though it's simple. But, but, but the reason is that I want to understand it differently. Uh, and by this different understanding is how I hope to open a, a way to my deduction of the of the next model of the model. And as one of the difficulties is the, the, the quotation that I had quoted at the beginning by Begomi, who's saying that despite the fact that um, um, uh, uh, Black and Scholes dynamics is inconsistent, inconsistent with the actual dynamics, it's still used uh, by everyone. And here I comment by saying that BSM has always been understood from the outside of it, from a larger po point of view, in which something else exists or had already varied. So either Black Scholes is understood from a sociological point of view where the, a world of trading existed before Black and Scholes, and then when the Black and Scholes formula came, the Black Scholes formula shaped the market, and then the volatilities of the options aligned to the constant, but the, the, the world existed before Black Scholes. The market model typically assumed that option prices should exist before we even apply Black Scholes. And all, the only usage of Black Scholes that they have is as an accounting equation. We buy the option in the existing market. Then we see whether we make money or lose money depending on what on what's the um, uh, break even level of volatility. So what I need now to, to, to try to do is to try to understand Black Scholes really from the inside of Black Scholes, from what really Black Scholes, if I follow through its formalism, is telling me. So let us think really deeply about Black Scholes and the option market. So if you think about it really, according to the Black Scholes formalism, the underlying equity S is the only thing trading. There is, uh, the, 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 you have to, uh, nothing else trades than the underlying equity S. And of course, this is like a, a stock exchange. So we have no notion uh, of valuation of fundamental value and we only have price. And because of it, it's a stock exchange, is it's you know, the price can only fluctuate because we have no notion of, of fundamental value. And you know that Keynes has said that it's the duty contest, where the only thing that determines the price is whether people as anticipate that the price will go up or, or down. It's not that people speculate on on the on the most beautiful woman. They speculate on the woman that other people will think is the most beautiful. So there is always a kind of self-reference because there is no ground of valuation and no fundamental value. And that's why there is only price. And that's why when you really think about that, and this, by the way, is why a lot of people are scared, are scared by, the, by the stock exchange because they, 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 they see that there is no fundamental principle of valuation, but only speculation. So if you look at this, um, at this, uh, at this, at this thing from this angle, volatility becomes the only fundamental con concept in such a market. So the volatility becomes the volatility of price of the of the stock becomes the only fundamental value uh, because there is no other, no, no fundamental value. So we, we go one level in the logic. The, the, the stock has no value. It's only priced and it's priced is fluctuates because there is no ground for valuation. So volatility becomes the only concept of the market, and volatility becomes, as I said, the only fundamental thing. Which from which, by the way. Following Black Scholes, the value of derivative is impeccably and unassailably derived. So that's the magic of Black Scholes. So when we thought that there was no way of value, valuing anything any longer because everything was up to the market and to the crazy fluctuation of a stock exchange, we got volatility. But suddenly, now that we have conceptualized this volatility, suddenly now we are able to value option. And because we are valuing option, from volatility, which is the very criticism of, uh, of, of value, because it's volatility, the valuation of options becomes unassailable. It becomes unassailable because it flows from the very criticism of value, which is price and the volatility of price. So it couldn't be criticized itself. And this way, by, by the way, if you reason really by saying that options are evaluated above the floor just by in the meta level, if you will, of the underlying stock um, uh, trading pit, Thinking it of this way, there is no way derivatives could be traded in the in the in the same in the formal picture traded alongside the underlying because they, they are evaluated of some conceptual raise, reasoning which uh, rises above uh, the underlying um, uh, pit. So there is no way derivatives could be traded could be tra traded at all because they are they are evaluated uh, from um, uh, volatility. And by, by the way, we haven't written any stochastic process for them. We have valued them. So if you really think uh, about Black Scholes, 
So people think that the options do not trade in black shoals because they are, they are redundant. No, I say that they don't even exist because all we have in the formal picture of black shoals is just the underlying equity trading. And somebody is, from God's point of view, um, conceptualizing the trading as volatility and evaluating options in heaven, if you will, not on the floor. Yet, of course, we know that they are going to be traded on the floor. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, how in a second. But first of all, let me further um, uh, emphasize the fact uh, that I'm saying here. Here I quote a paper by Harrison and Pliska uh, in 80, 1981, which is the paper that triggerized um, uh, Black and Scholes. So Black and Scholes derived their equation in 1973, but it was like heuristical more or less. And this paper by Harrison and Pliska is the first to have really formalized it. And if you read into their paper, it's amazing because they say, we have focused on a market where only the stock and bond are traded, so no options. And we have discovered that investors can manufacture call options for themselves in this market at the price specified for the formula. So no option market. If you really follow through, the, through, the, through this uh, formalism of black shoals, you, you trade dynamically the bond and the stock and all you can manufacture is contingent payoffs. So you manufacture call options for yourself, not for somebody else with whom you are trading. So they continue by saying, no comparison, strictly speaking, is made with the price at which options do sell, might sell, or should sell outside our market. Also, it's obviously possible to do so. So our market is the market just of the underlying end of the bond. So there is, there is no notion of another market where options trade. It is customary, they, call, they say, to go further arguing that arbitrage profits could be made if options were sold in a parallel market to reduce verbiage and to get a self-contained mathematical theory, which are simply stop with the statement of attainability. So strictly speaking, if you read, and the paper, uh, the title was Martingales and Stochastic Integrals in the Theory of Continuous Trading. If you read through a paper like that, which really rigorizes black shoals, you can see that no, I mean, there's no way that options could trade and there's even no way that options could be mentioned as independent uh, contracts of which you could say that they are redundant of not, they don't even exist. All you have is contingent payoffs that you can get. So the real problem that we have is how to really extend uh, Harrison and Pliska to the uh, uh, options market. So one way that I propose is the following, is that the volatility that a minute ago I have recognized as being the fundamental value of the market was a qualitative concept and as such unquantified. One way of quantifying it is by putting a number on the assets volatility. So this is the path chosen by econometricians and econophysicists. But another way, an alternative way, so volatility, if you think of it as the fundamental concept of a crowd that is only trading the underlying equity S, volatility is just a concept for now. So it, it, has, it has no number on it. I haven't quantified it yet. One way of quantifying it is to start doing time series and econometric, econometrics and to start you know, um, uh, measuring volatility statistically. That's one way. Another way, which is alternative to this and therefore is incompatible with the first one, if, of putting a number on the conceptual and unquantified volatility if through the option price or implied volatility. So to me, implied volatility is a completely different register than historical volatility or, or real volatility of the underlying S. And therefore, in this new reading, there never was volatility in the sense of um, uh, the quantified volatility of the underlying S, and even less so stochastic volatility. So no stochastic volatility process at all, but immediately implied volatility. So from the concept of volatility unquantified, I immediately quantified to implied volatility. Uh, and so I immediately get implied volatility, okay? And what is also unthought, unthought in Black Scholes, so, um, is that if you think of it for a minute, the market maker is able to, according to this reading, to make the market of, uh, of options and to write the options because he replicates it exactly and he replicates it exactly because volatility is constant. So he makes the market because volatility is constant, not because as everybody thinks that the volatility is stochastic or volatility is uncertain. So according to my reading, it's not the case that options market exists because volatility is stochastic or volatility is uncertain. Option market exists because market makers 
have learned the black and Scholes formula, and because the volatility is constant on the contrary, that they are able to create options by writing them for the first time. It is only later when options are created that they start trading and therefore reality changes. So the reality which now opens up, which is that options start trading is completely different from the reality of the formalism of black Scholes. So that's why there is a complete insulation between the, the implied volatility that I'm going to get next when options start trading and uh, the uh, volatility that I had first. Okay. What you want is never to get values, but immediately prices of options. And the whole problem that we have here is really how, how is it that the underlying market, the one that you started with, with Harrison and Pliska, which with only the underlying and the bond, how could it price derivatives? I don't want to value derivatives because if I start valuing derivatives by, by, by putting stochastic processes, I take a step back out of the market and I'm valuing and no longer uh, pricing. Okay, so here, uh, if I have uh, for the la for, for next five, 10 minutes, I'm going finally to, to guide you through uh, what I call uh, the man's model. First of all, I have a passage here, which is crucial uh, by, through a statement by Eliette Guimont, who provided me with the first step in the new uh, space of variation of, of volatility that I need. So what I need, as I said, I want to strike a middle ground between the uh, view of God's model, where I know what the stochastic volatility of the underlying is as a stochastic process, and market models where there are only implied volatilities. I want to find something in between, which I will deduce from this strict reading of Black Scholes. So Eliette Guimont um, writes the following in 97, and she wrote that article in response to somebody who was not happy that Black and Scholes had earned the Nobel Prize in, in 97, uh, when, according to this critic, uh, the economy of Black Scholes uh, was trivial because volatility was constant. And she uh, writes by saying, on the contrary, the economy of Black Scholes is risky by definition because it, because it amounts to exchanging volatility. Uh, the fact that this risk should be materialized by a single little number sigma makes it palpable and immediate for everyone. So, this doesn't mean the economy of BSM, according to Elliot, is risky because volatility is going to become stochastic, uh, as everybody thinks. On the contrary, it is risky because it is a constant in a way, and it is a single little number. And because it's a single little number that it is palpable and that we are able to exchange it. And therefore, the exchange of volatility is the uh, thing that we need. So how to be true to Black and Charles Merton and generalize Black and Charles Merton in this direction, which I think is the one that strikes the right balance, is first of all, to follow through what Eliette Guimont is saying. She is saying sigma is a single little number. So it means that it's constant, this number then. And this number is ready to be exchanged, not changed. So I don't want to change it by later turning it into stochastic volatility process because there wouldn't be a problem if we just quantitatively match the derivative prices with stochastic volatility process. This releases the tension and erases a smile. On the contrary, the smile problem is the persistence of the palpable exchangeable number. We must keep the twist, if not literally uh, BSM. So I want to keep the fact that because it's constant, it's going to be exchanged. And the problem that I have next is that if it is exchanged, then what? What does it mean if, if volatility is exchanged? Then obviously I will have options markets. Then obviously volatility can no longer be constant. But I'm saying I don't want to have implied balls uh, all over the place, like in the market models. And I don't want to have volatility become stochastic. So what can I have? OK. So what's after BSM then, if we take it from this strict point of view? So I don't want to depose BSM by saying it's wrong. I want to superpose uh, BSMs. So to have as many, um, uh, several uh, BSM models in a way. And the option, the option, because every time Black Scholes deals with option, it's unique at every time. So the option should remain unique. I don't want to have, um, after um, um, I have um, um, uh, used Black Scholes, the multiplicity of options as in the market models. So I want a way that the single little number should remain constant 
meaning I don't want to find to write another a further stochastic process for volatility. I don't want to write an explicit volatility or volatility process, and it should remain single. So how, how can we do that? So the key again, once again, is in Black Scholes Merton, but I want to turn the key in two totally unexpected direction. So the answer is that the generalization of the Black Scholes relativity number that I want is going to be a matrix. So you know that matrix is, matrices generalize numbers such that a matrix such that the multiplicity that I'm going to get anyway, why I'm going to get multiplicity, either of the process of volatility or of the processes of implied volatility, I want them to reside inside that single number, not outside of it. So I, I want a number, of course, it's not going to be naively a single number, so it's going to be a matrix in a way. However, I don't want to get outside the matrix and have either a process for stochastic volatility or an infinity of processes of implied volatilities like in the market models, I have to have them inside that number in order to keep it single. So our goal is to find a structure, to find a space of variation of a new type for the exchange, not the quantitative change of volatility, the exchange of volatility. The exchange, as I said, will introduce the multiple. So multiple options that I will be trading one after the other after I have used black holes for them. And those options will share the same reality of the one market. So it seems that there will be multiple options and therefore that my model should accommodate a multiplicity of options. And it seems that volatility will be in need of a quantitative process of stochastic process as a result. But I argued that this multiplicity should be introduced inside the single number in order to keep the tension and keep the twist that Eliette uh, is talking about, Eliette Gebon, and in order not to escape outside the instant of making the market, not to escape outside the black and shoals, not to escape in the space of quantitative variation. Okay. And this is how I believe that I can find this number who will generalize uh, the, the, the single little number of black shoals and provide me with an, an answer where the model that I'm looking at, I'm calling it man's model because again, it's a generalization of black shoals and the generalization of what I understand best in black shoals and what you understand best in, in black shoals is that it's a market makers uh, market. Uh, as Eliette said, because a single little number is my, in my hand, I'm able to write the option, uh, the first option, and present it to the market and become a market maker. Uh, so the whole idea is to find the model that can still fit in the market maker's hand and uh, apply at all levels. So I don't want like a vision of the market as a machine where I, I, I am an engineer and I'm looking at the pricing function, the automatic pricing function that just automatically tells me, uh, given the price of the vanilla, this is the price of the exotic. So I'm not looking for that because that's automatic. And I'm, looking, I'm not looking either at the point of view of God where God tells me everything is priced from a, 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 a true formula. I want to generalize what I called the making of the market in Black Scholes. And the making of, of the market in Black Scholes concerned one option at the time because there was only one volatility number and I was able to exchange that number and that the implied volatility number of the underlying stock became directly, as I said, the implied volatility of that option. So how is it that I can deal with the multiplicity of options? Because I will have, of course, the full vanilla surface once I trade options. And then after vanillas, I will have the VIX. And after the VIX, I will have the options on the VIX, et cetera. So obviously, I will have a multiplicity of derivatives in number and in uh, uh, payoff structures. So how to deal with that? While at every single step that I make the next market, I keep the idea of keeping a single number, which is constant which doesn't change, but is exchanged. This is, uh, I think, that's my speculation. And that's, I mean, as I said, it's not, there's no mathematical proof, but only, only philosophical speculation can be achieved with the regime switching structure, which is this one. So the regime switching structure, uh, just to give you an idea, here I, here I illustrated with three regimes. It's a superposition of, if you will, three Black-Scholes um, um, uh, processes. So imagine that here I have colors. So uh, S is the um, uh, red and um, the yellow is for volatility. And this is the interest rate say. So all we have is a, a, a um, uh, Brownian diffusion 
in each of the regimes. So regime one have a certain Brownian diffusion. Regime two has a different Brownian diffusion number. And regime three is a different diffusion number. So I have three uh, different Black-Scholes, if you will, processes. And I switch between them with Poisson processes. So I have Poisson processes that can switch me from uh, sigma one to sigma two to sigma three and back. And every time I switch, I get different values of volatility and different values of interest rate, for instance. And every time I switch between regimes, the underlying stock itself uh, undergoes a, a jump. Switching entails a jump in volatility, in credit, uh, and in the underlying asset price. So this is the description of the regime switching. Again, I have N regimes. In this case, I have only illustrated with three regimes. In the first regime, it's a Brownian diffusion with a certain number. The second regime, a different number. And the third regime, a different number yet. And the way I switch between them is by Poisson processes. Therefore, Poisson processes will induce jumps in the values of volatilities. And at the same time, the underlying jumps. Uh, so that's how I correlate uh, jumps in volatility and uh, jumps in the underlying stock price. But the crucial point, which will get me what I want, meaning how to get the multiplicity through a single number or through a single generalized number, which is the matrix, is the associativity of regime switching, which I will illustrate now. So imagine a situation where today I have a model, which I have called A, which is a regime switching model with three regimes, different regimes, which I calibrate. So imagine an ongoing practice. Uh, so I have already uh, the market of vanillas, which exists. So I calibrate this model uh, to the um, uh, vanilla uh, surface, which is uh, possible because I have uh, enough parameters to, good, to do the calibration. And therefore, I have calibrated a, um, a, um, my regime switching to the vanillas. And the next day, I have to calibrate to the new uh, intake of vanilla. So the next day, I will have another uh, model um, uh, because I'm doing recalibration, uh, as you remember. So the next day, but the parameters of my regimes will be different from the, from the first day. So it seems as if I have recalibrated my model and it's no longer the same model because all the parameters have changed. So in reality, it seems that the true model, uh, if we can say so, is a superposition of the one, the model from uh, day one and the model from day two, which, which becomes a six regime models because it seems as if I'm switching now between those models. So it seems that the meta model or the model uh, of reality is A plus B, which is still a regime switching model. So that's the important uh, thing. That's that the, volat the stochastic vol of vol is still of the same nature. It's still a regime switching model. And now the crucial observation is to say that maybe, uh, and also what happens from day one to day two, not only I have recalibrated to a new vanilla surface, but let's, let's imagine that the market maker who has used the model in day one to produce VIX uh, options, say, as, as a new derivatives, the next day, so he became a market maker of derivatives. Imagine Sokjian becoming a market maker of VIX options. The next day, because he's trading the options, the VIX option in the market, the VIX options start admitting of smiles. So he also need to readapt, to integrate in his calibration, not just the vanilla options of the first day, but the vanilla option of the second day, plus the options on the VIX option. So, so the whole purpose is to, to fit the three, but chances are that maybe on the second day, I can still fit a three regime uh, switching structure, not six. Maybe three is enough to, in order the next day to fit the new vanilla surface and the new smile of options on VIX, okay? So it is in the end. So let's forget about uh, the sixth regime, which was only a step in the reasoning, because uh, in order to show you, maybe the sixth regime reduces to three if my only purpose was to fit all this. The conclu conclusion is that in the end, I end up also with a regime switching structure, which is the similar to the first one. So it's as if my number hasn't become multiple and it's still the same. I haven't written a new process for volatility of volatility. It's left unsettled whether the initial three regime was a model of stochastic volatility or a model of stochastic volatility of volatility. So in conclusion, this is the feature uh, which I want. It's because regime switching is associative, meaning if I superpose two regime switching models, they give me 
a six regime switching model, but maybe the six regime switching model for all practical purposes, I don't need the full six regime, but I can reduce them to three regimes. And what are the, 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 the practical purposes is to fit the new tradables, meaning the new vanilla surface and the new options on VIX. So maybe I can do that with a new regime, a three regime with new parameters. And, because, and this shows me that it's as if I was using still the same volatility number sigma, which is the single one. And it's not determined whether I'm fitting a market of vanillas or a market of options on the vanillas or options on the VIX. And uh, the nice thing about the regimes is that it's, it's generic. So even if the next day I have a, an index, a volatility index written on the options on VIX and options written on that volatility index, I can repeat. I don't stop like Bergomi uh, and say that my, my, my structure cannot accommodate the next market. I can add as many regimes as I can and always uh, fit uh, the next one because my, um, my, uh, my, my structure, the regime switching is, um, is, the, is, is generic. So the conclusion is that God knows truth but God cannot trade because he knows truth. So why, why should he trade? So the, the God's point of view is the end of the market. The market models of, um, that we have seen or the machine cannot reproduce the genesis or the moment of the exchange, which was key in Eliette Gaimond's um, uh, observation, because they always start after the genesis, after the market exists and uh, calibration. And only a finite situated being who is neither God nor the machine can exchange and can every time makes the market out of non-existence because not, don't forget that the option, options markets have to be written um, because they don't exist in the previous, in, in the previous uh, instance. And we need for that a model that can fit the hand of a market maker and can be generic. And this is uh, the regime switching model, hopefully. And so to, to answer the question, shall we write processes for instantaneous underlying assets volatility, such as rough volatility or processes for the options implied volatility, such as the Bergomi and the market model? And the answer is either both often or neither, because in the regime switching, it's neither this or that, but it's both at the same time. Thank you. Sorry, I have used a lot of this. Oh, we had uh, um, we had lots of folks staying on, so I'm sure you hear applause globally, Ellie. Thank you very much. We we don't have time for too many questions, but are you okay to answer a few? Of course, yeah. And again, my apologies uh, because that, that the stuff was dense and uh, and I'm a bit tired at the end of the day, so that's why I had to repeat myself repeatedly. <laughs> he, well, you put your all into it. That's why, like any uh, any great performance, right? But thank you so much for that. And we do have, we have a couple of good questions here. Um, I think Barbara Max first here. She asks. She's interested to hear what local volatility models might offer to to this line of thought. I hope you know what she means by this line of thought. Maybe she could clarify. Thinking of Derman and Connie, nineteen ninety four, and Dupier in uh, nineteen ninety four as well. If we try to approach the closest possible T point to instant instantaneous volatility, then then what? Is that clear? That question? Not really. So, the, is it about local volatility? So, what is local volatility? Yeah, yeah. Interested to hear what local volatility vo what local volatility mo models might offer to this line of thought. I mean, uh, local volatility models. It's not a model that I like a lot because um, uh, it is pretty much constrained uh, by, by the fact that it has only um, uh, the underlying equity uh, being stochastic. However, uh, uh, Lorenzo Bergomi, again, to cite him, has a very interesting reinterpretation of the local volatility model. He interprets it as a market model. So what's essential in this interpretation is that even though the next day I'm going to recalibrate my local volatility model to a new intake of vanilla prices. And therefore, I'm going to completely change the local volatility function that I'm inferring from it. It's not a reason, like everybody used to think, to think, it's not a reason to think that the local volatility model is not practical because I'm recalibrating it and breaking it. On the contrary, we should consider it as a black box. And if it's a black box, I don't care what's happening inside of it. What's important is that am I able to control my PNL using it through the recalibration? And the answer by Bergomi is yes, because he explicitly shows that even though you've recalibrated it, the, the break even of the PNL is still possible under, of course, some break even volatility matrix that we hope will, will occur, but it's possible. So the local volatility model is, on the contrary, the first 
market model according to Bergomi. So it's not Black Shores. Black Shores is not a market market model because Black Shores cannot take uh, an intake of, of vanilla options, but the local volatility model can. And it's very illuminating to read what he has to say about why it is a market model. So, Barbara, hope that answers your question. If not, or if a follow up, you can just please enter it in the Q and A. Okay, David asks, how does this? How does the model free pricing approach of Terry Lyons, based on rough path theory and signature payoff, fit in here? <laughs> I'm, 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 it surpasses me. I, have, I haven't. Uh, I'm sorry to say, but I haven't. I've heard of it. Uh, but I haven't uh, really uh, uh, paid, paid much thought uh, to it. I mean, I'm sure. I'm sure that I mean you can't stop progress. Uh, it's true that I seem to be criticizing graph volatility. However, there is definitely progress, scientific progress in graph volatility. Because yes, I mean I have to believe that the time series of volatilities are fractional bound in motion. And of course, it's nice to uh, show arguments why uh, it is so. So there's definitely is progress there. Uh, I have nothing against write, writing a lot of papers uh, of theoretical finance, but the only point is that from a practical point of view, what is the model that I should use as a market maker of options? So to answer any question about you know, new fancy theories and new um, um, uh, fancy ways of, of seeing, of, of understanding statistics or understanding process or whatnot, the answer is what Bergomi says is, am I able to uh, control the PNL. And if I'm able to do that, I will call it a passing function and I won't, I don't care what's inside the black box. Uh, that's, that's the, and it's philosophically, it's, it's a difficult thought. So that's why I spent time and uh, I refer you to the articles in Wilmot to really uh, maybe, maybe, maybe understand a little bit um, uh, in, uh, uh, in a slower kind of uh, reading what I have said in this presentation. Excellent. We'll take, if you wouldn't mind, we'll take one final question, Ellie. Yeah. Um, okay, so matter of incentives, I'd like to ask what can, okay, I'd like to ask what incentives, um, basically what incentives can be placed on the industry to switch to the concepts presented here, uh, because we've been through some crashes and crises with almost 40, over the last 40 years, basically. So it's really a matter of incentives, I guess, could you speak to that? Well, I mean, <clears throat> again, let's not forget that I used to be an option market maker myself. Uh, Bergomi used to work for a bank who, which was a market maker. Uh, so I'm, maybe I'm out of the, uh, out of fashion because maybe maybe tomorrow everyone is going to be to be to do machine learning anyway, and the machines were going to uh, price options and uh, automatically. Still, I don't believe I don't believe that it, it, this can be possible because um, uh, I, I, I believe um, the mar markets are made by men um, always, and um, so. My presentation today, to be modest, is I'm still looking from a point of view of market making. I still believe that uh, if you make markets um, on exotics, uh, fine, but maybe the exotics will become so liquid that they themselves become, you know, standard instruments, and then later you will have to uh, to make markets on options on those exotics. So what I'm I'm hoping to 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 show you is a model, the regime switching model, which is numerically very tractable because it's easy to solve. Because it's only, as I said, a superposition of Black Scholes formula. So numerically, it's very easy to solve. And it is um, a general purpose. It, will, it can accommodate any calibration to any uh, new instrument. And it solves the problem uh, that I have pointed in Bergomi, where he has to stop at some point. The, the, the regime switching doesn't stop. It can still recalibrate uh, all kinds of things. And it's, um, it's, it's fast to compute. So that's only my contribution is I'm still you know, talking for market makers and um, uh, who want to bank markets in options. Uh, hopefully they still exist. <laughs> well, Ellie, thank you very much. Good, all right, thanks everybody, take care. Thank you, Christian, thank you very uh, much. My, our pleasure, take care, bye-bye. Thank you for your patience, bye-bye.